Hey guys, Simon Hayes here. I'm here today with DPA to talk about how you're going to grow your career. I think that anyone who ends up being a production sound mixer has fought pretty hard to get there. I think we're all potentially on the edge of being obsessively compulsive about things because guess what, it's sound. Um, very few people care about it as much as we do and uh, we are left to our own devices a lot on a film set. So part of that is our sound kit and it's what enables us to do the job properly. And what I can tell you from day one is that I always prioritized having a really, really good sound kit where I wouldn't have to compromise my workflow on set. Um, I would always have everything that I needed. So for my first few years, I literally spent, you know, every spare penny on my kit. And um, you know, my kits, my, my, my sound kit took priority and my microphones took priority. And what I would say is, is that if you're having to compromise the recordings that you're making due to lack of kit, then you're potentially not doing yourself justice. And I saw buying the kit that I needed and allowing myself to be able to make the creative choices on the set rather than being technically bound by the lack of kit that I had, I found that to be an investment in my future career. And that's what it was. It was certainly an investment in my future career. And every single time I make a movie, I'm still buying more equipment. I'm still putting a certain amount of my equipment uh, rental money back into making sure that my kit is as up to date as it can possibly be. It's always going to be difficult building relationships in the film industry, even more difficult for us in the sound department because you can't see sound. You can see the set, you can see the actors, you can see the costumes, you can see the lighting, you can see the makeup, you can't see the sound. And so the way that I always try and build relationships is never talking about sound, always talking about performance. Everyone cares about the performance. That is what we're there to protect. Every single person on the film set is there to protect and support the actor's performance. And so when I talk about sound, I just change the word sound to performance because after all, that is what the sound is. It's the performance. And suddenly, the moment I started doing that and I just literally exchanged the word sound for performance, I started getting much, much better relationships built quicker um, because you're talking about something which people understand. You're talking about uh, the creative endeavor, which we're all in together, which is to capture those actors' original performances. And you're not talking about something which is a little bit anoraki, a little bit technical, which no one's really that interested in because you can't see it. What I'm trying to do is to learn all of the time. I'm trying to assess my own performance and look at where I was weak, where I was strong. Um, I'm also looking at the director's previous work. I'm looking at the actor's previous work. I'm looking at the script that we're shooting. I'm trying to work out what the director and the composer are going to do with the score because that will have a bearing on how I record the sound or the different choices that I give them. I'm going to look at how I think the film's going to be intercut in picture editing. For instance, is this scene potentially going to be intercut with that scene, in which case we need to match the dialogue perspectives up? You know, all of the time I'm trying to look at all of the various clues which I've got, which will help me be better at my job. What I'm not doing is just coming in on spec, getting a boom out, putting some labs on people and recording the sound. I'm trying to use every single bit of information available to me. The biggest bit of information available to us is the director's IMDB page, looking back at their previous films, listening to them, listening to how they've used score, how they've used sound effects, and generally just trying to get to know that director and how he or she likes to work, because that will really help me do a great job on the production sound for them.
You know, it's really important that we don't just see ourselves as uh, as the sound department, that we see ourselves as part of the filmmaking team. You know, we're collaborating with all of the other HODs. We are uh, there to support the original performances. We're there to support the filmmaking. Um, and the moment we see ourselves as just a singular department, we're going the wrong route into the way that we should be working. We should be learning as much about the camera as we possibly can. We should certainly be learning as much about picture editing as much as we can and how that will impact our production sound when the picture editor starts cutting it together in Avid. You know, are those backgrounds going to match up? Is the perspective on the production dialogue going to match up? We should be learning as much as possible about what the dialogue editor can do um, to help us and also how we can make sure that we're not going to present the dialogue editor with a fait accompli where they're going to have to end up ADRing something because we're not sending in enough choices or we're sending in lame tracks that aren't going to work. You know, the more time we can spend learning about what our colleagues do, the greater we're going to be at our own jobs. We should be learning about what the grips do so that when we have a squeaky track, we know where it's coming from. We should be learning about what the pressures are on the focus puller so that when the boom operator and the focus puller are having to negotiate who's going to stand in the corner of a room at a certain point and, and you know, and learning to do the dance that the focus puller and the and the boom operator do together we need to understand the pressures that the focus puller is under it's really really important that the more we learn about filmmaking we understand the better we're going to be in the sound department the thing that you can never do is say no and if you are going to say no make sure it's very very early on before there's a camera on a dolly before the film crew have turned up it should be before you've even got to the recce stage. If you're saying, look, you know, it's going to be impossible for us to work at Waterloo Station and to get that dialogue clean, the first thing you should be asking yourself is, okay, look at the script. Why is this page of dialogue taking place at Waterloo Station? You read the script, you work out that it absolutely has got to take place there. So you've got to work out how you're going to best capture that dialogue and not have to ADR the scene and work out, you know, is it that you're going to have to use two Lavaliers on someone because they're going to be doing a radical head turn throughout the whole scene? You know, is it that you're going to have to be asking for the boom to be painted out um, rather than to ADR on that scene? But it's basically trying to work out solutions. You know, when you're given a problem, try and work out a solution. The answer shouldn't be no. Um, you know, obviously, rules can be broken there there have been times in my career where i've said no but the more films i do the more experienced i get the more i realize that saying no just damages my career and my reputation what i'm trying to do is to find a positive spin and working out how to get how, how it is i'm going to get what i need but still fulfill the director's criteria What I'm there to do is to give the director that I'm working with confidence. Confidence that the sound department is there to capture their script. Confidence that the sound department is there not to be a hindrance, to, but to be a support, to be a rock solid support for their filmmaking endeavors. Confidence that whatever they throw at me and my department, we're gonna have a solution and we're gonna be able to handle it. So. The most important thing that has nothing to do with recording sound is instilling confidence. There isn't a one size fits all. What I think that assistants have to do is you've got to follow your instinct. You've got to follow your ambition. You've got to follow where you want to be in your career. You know, if you desperately want to be a production sound mixer really quickly, then you can fast track yourself and you can kind of, you know, just do a couple of years in each position. But understand that when you do become a production sound mixer, you're potentially going to be more limited in the amount of experience you've got. How will that manifest itself in your career and, and on the set? It will mean that when you're presented with difficult scenes to record or difficult situations, situations to negotiate on a film set you're going to have less experience to do that because you didn't spend as long as an assistant so i would say that you've got to follow your instincts to a certain extent
I think that it's really important to work with different people. But if you click with a specific person or a specific team and they uh, keep inviting you back, then obviously you're doing a great job. One thing that I would say about my boom operator, Arthur, is he always saw boom operating as a creative endeavor. He always saw it a little bit. You know, you see the same thing with grips on dollies. You know, the very best dolly grips see themselves as a creative uh a creative component of the filmmaking regime. Uh, they don't see themselves as a technician. The same with boom operating. It's very, very creative swinging that pole. You're almost doing, I know we talked about doing a dance with the focus puller. You're also doing a dance with the actors. You're working off their breathing patterns. You're working off the rhythms of their dialogue. You're learning that he's going to say that there, you're going to say that there. And that boom is almost organic and it's swinging and you're moving with the performance rather than it being about digits and about 48 volts and about you know all of these different other technical aspects within our job what i think the best advice i can give you with regards the technical part of our job versus the creative part of our job is that the technical part of our job should be a given all of that information should just be up there and something that you're not having to think about a little bit like when you speak in your first language you don't have to formulate sentences before you actually say what you feel or what you mean you just say it and it's the same with being a creative component of the sound department you shouldn't be thinking about how you're going to technically achieve things you should already know that and then you can lend your whole uh, your whole priority making uh, process to to the creativity of what you're trying to do on the film set so early on in my career I started doing films through people that I worked with on short films so they would then invite me to come and do their feature films as I got a little bit more experienced, I started getting asked to go in for interviews for films, which were new to me, where you would go in and you sit with a producer and a director and they'd interview you. And I realized that this was a huge, huge part of getting films for people that you hadn't worked with previously. And I tried to work out how I was going to come across, how I was going to talk about sound without it being boring, without it making me seem like an anorak. And again, what I tried to do was to talk about the creative aspect. And my advice to anyone watching this is when you're interviewing for a job, whether it's a feature film or a TV show or even a commercial, don't talk about the technical aspects. No one wants to know about the technical aspect. It's a given that you're going to do a good job technically because guess what? They've invited you in for an interview. Try and talk to them about what their vision is. Try and talk to them about the creative side of what you're all trying to achieve. Try and talk to them about, in broad brushstrokes, about how you do your job, but don't talk to them about whether you're going to use a DPA 4071 or, or as a lav or a 4061 because guess what? They really don't care. What they want to know is that you're going to make the best choice for that scene with the lav that you're going to put on. And the other thing that I would say is, is don't make broad statements in interviews. I can remember situations where I said, well, yes, we, we mainly use the booms and I have two boom operators and, you know, we very rarely use radio mics and I've turned up on a film. And guess what? The way that the director is putting shots together, it's actually, it's a radio mic film and we've had to use radio mics on almost every scene. And, you know, and, and I've had directors say to me, but I thought that you only used the booms. So... You know, one of the things that I would say is, is don't box yourself into a corner talking about your workflow. Understand that you're potentially going to have to work within the confines of what you're presented with on the film set. So stylistically, try not to talk about your style because it may be that the style that you're talking about isn't going to fit in with the way that the director, the DP and the picture editor are going to make this movie. Um, so try and just get as much information from them and, and, you know, be genuinely excited about their vision for the film. Get as much information as possible about how they want to make the film. Um, 
and let them talk loads because no one wants to hear the sound mixer talking technically about how he's going to record a scene. As I say, that's something which, apart from other sound mixers and people in the department, they don't need to, to know about that. What they need to know is that you're going to do a great job and that you're listening to them and that you want to be a part of the collaborative team to help them make their movie. <laughs> 